Good afternoon, everyone. I, I, I must admit, when, when Dirk first contacted me online, and it was not like an online dating service or something, he, he actually, I think he even sent me an email, which is, I guess, a little out of date these days, but uh, I, I had no idea what he was talking about. But it, it's been a pleasure to be here and to sit through the, the discussions so far this morning. Is th this is an opportunity to completely transform an industry. And that's really something special. We don't get a chance to do that very much. Uh, I, I've spent my career with, with my colleagues at Schaefer Consulting working with companies, organizations, uh, governments. Like we recently worked with the, the Veterans Administration on homelessness for veterans. Uh, companies like GE, Cisco others, um, working on how to transform and change. How to take, as, as Bill talked about earlier today, how do you take a, an, an old organization that's been successful in the past but has sort of gotten stuck, and how do you move them forward and, and get that energy going again? But one of the things we've found over and over again, and that I've been really focusing on, as Dirk said, is that it's hard to be innovative when your company or your organization is so complex, when it's just hard to get things done. When there's no time to innovate because you're spending so much time filling out forms and doing reports and trying to figure out what the data is, and just how do you do things? And when that becomes overwhelming, then there's no time left for innovation. So that's what I'm going to talk about. And I want to try to sort of uh, give you a little inspiration about thinking about what's the complexity in your own organization, and are there some ways to begin to reduce it? And I want to start with a couple of questions, sort of easy easy questions for you. And I know it's after lunch, and as uh, Denise and I were talking, some of you have the turkey, and you may be you know, starting to, the, 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 uh, whatever that enzyme is, is starting to kick in, and you're starting to get a little sleepy. So a couple of, of questions. First one, just very easy. To what extent do you think complexity does have an impact on your business, a negative impact? And the second question, this is also an easy question, to what extent do you think complexity affects the morale and the kind of the quality of work life of you and your people. So here we've established with this group of what I, I presume to be bright, well-educated, important people that complexity is a problem that affects the business and it affects the quality of work life and ability of people to get things done. So I have one further question, which is to what extent do you feel that you are the cause of complexity in your organizations? Anybody? OK. And I've asked this of probably thousands of managers now over the last number of years. It, it's a fascinating phenomena, because we all complain about complexity. But I don't think any of you, and no other manager that I know, wakes up in the morning and says, my job today is to try to make things harder for my customers to access our products, for my suppliers to be able to do business with us and for my employees to be able to get things done. I'm going to make it as complex as possible today. Anybody feel that's in your job description? Probably not. But yet, somehow, it all happens. And that's the sort of what I call the dirty little secret of management, which is we are the cause of complexity, that we have met the enemy, and he is us, or she is us, or we is us. Whatever the politically correct term is, this is a quote from Pogo, old quote there. But we are the cause of complexity. So I want to share a couple of stories of how managers have kind of gotten through complexity, done something about that, and begun to simplify their organization in such a way that they can then start to think in terms of transformation and innovation. So first story, the Aeron chair, made by the Herman Miller Company. So it, it is the classic, iconic chair. It's won all kinds of design awards uh, in, in lots of places over many years. It's the flagship product for Herman Miller. It's a fantastic product. A little, little pricey, but very comfortable. Great, great chair. Now, a few years ago, a woman named Mary Stevens was appointed senior vice president of products for the uh, Herman Miller. And she had, is one of her main goals is to be in charge of the Aeron chair. And she looked at the data. She says, this is a great, great assignment. So now I'm, I'll have to check the narrative and say, you know, here's the, her expectations versus what was the reality. When she looked at the data, she saw revenues going up. We're selling more and more Aeron chairs, and profitability going down or remaining flat. In other words, the margins 
for the Aeron share were decreasing. So it was no longer as profitable as it was. So they're selling more of it and making less money. And this was what I would, yes, you would call a narrative conflict. So she was wondering, what's going on here? How is that possible? So she began to do some exploration of what's going on with this Aeron chair. And what she found is that there was a culture in Herman Miller, among the designers, of we want to give our customers as much choice as possible about customizing the Aeron chair. So she found that there were 19 different parts of the chair that could be customized, customizable. And with each of those 19 parts, there were more than a dozen different choices, material, tensile strength, et cetera. So she did the simple math. I don't know if anybody here good at math? You do, I think it's like 19 times 12 factorial of some. Any, any idea how many different versions of the Aeron chair were being promised to customers? Can anyone, anyone guess what the number would be? 228. Well, it's very close. The number was 140 million. <laughs> if you really add up all the permutations and combinations, 140 million different versions of this chair are promised to customers. Now, you're all in the supply chain business and operate, you know, so she went back through her supply chain and said, you know, what, what's going on here? And she found that all the suppliers were geared up for exceptions. None of them were making routine chairs. None of them, although they could, but none of them were geared up because they knew that there were all kinds of exceptions, so nothing was standardized. And it had gotten worse and worse and worse over the years. She then went back to the data and said, how many chairs are actually being sold? Of the 240 million, 4,000 constituted almost 99% of the sales, and about 400, the bulk of those. So your 280 was, was pretty close to what people actually order. So she went back, and the, the tough thing, though, was this is a culture of the company. The culture of the company was we need to give our customers as much choice as possible, thinking that that's going to be a good thing. And she began to realize that that choice was creating the kind of complexity that was not sustainable as a business. And then she went out and talked to customers and said, you know, the customers said, it's really confusing about how to buy a chair. It's really tough. I mean, we thought we'd just buy a chair. But there's too many choices. So the customers also found that to be too complex. So she's now cut it down to 12. And her goal is to get it down to 200,000 as the possibilities, out of which there would be a much smaller segment that's actually produced. So that's one thing. Mary Stevens is the hero of this story. She began to realize that this complexity was affecting her business and the ability to be able to serve customers. But this is a cultural thing that's not just in Herman Miller. We have this notion that more is better, and that the more choices, the more varieties, the more versions, the better off we'll be. And anybody who comes from, if you come from Africa, for example, or if even if you come from Asia, you come to the United States, one of the most overwhelming things is to go into a grocery store in the United States. I mean, I remember when I was a student and I was abroad, I got away for six months or a year, I came back here and, my God, everything was big and huge and there was too much of it. Do we really need 25 different varieties of toilet paper and orange juice and all that? How do we choose? Anybody know what are the most profitable retailer in the United States these days? Trader Joe's. That's the right answer. Trader Joe's which is associated also with Aldi in, in Europe, and, and particularly started in Germany. What the principle of Trader Joe's and the principle of Aldi is that each store has a certain number of SKUs, a certain number of stock keeping units of, of particular items in the store. And they cannot go above that number of items. So what that means is that as the store curates so Trader Joe's basically makes the choice for you. They look at all the different types of, of, uh, of orange juice, and they will pick two or three that they think most of their customers will want. They'll make sure that it's good quality. They'll have a couple of different price points. They'll have a couple of different choices of things. But they'll only give two or three choices. And if there is ever a new item that comes into the store that somebody says we ought to carry in Trader Joe's, they say, that's fine. What will we get rid of? 
So they have to reduce. They can't continually to be adding. It's almost like a sunset clause. You can't add new products until you get rid of old products. And therefore, they have become extremely popular. Customer surveys show people love to shop at Trader Joe's. It's easier to shop there. And it's much more profitable. They don't have to carry all that overhead. They don't have to do all that buying and shop. They spend a lot of time figuring out what are the right products, what are the products our customers would want, and make a selection of them and put those in the stores. How many of you shopped at Trader Joe's? I see almost everybody here. So this is the notion that the question of more is better is not always the case. So if we can simplify product selection is one way to move towards simplification. There are other things that we do in organizations, and we do these unintentionally and unconsciously. So this is a story about a pharmaceutical company. And if anyone knows anything about the pharmaceutical industry, and it's probably similar to many of your industries, which is revenue goes up, and it's directly correlated with the amount of time that salespeople are actually in direct contact with customers. So in the pharmaceutical industry, what that means is that the pharmaceutical reps, they call them detail people, and these are people with a good science background, talking to physicians, pharmacists, people in hospitals about the drugs, about the pharmaceutical products, what they do, their characteristics, their properties, et cetera. So having those conversations makes a huge difference. Now, in this big pharmaceutical company, they looked and said, oh, what can we do to increase sales? And you know, one thing is obviously, well, we just hire more salespeople. And they'd been doing that over and over again, and they had a very large sales force. And somebody stopped and said, you know, maybe we should see if we're getting the most productivity out of the sales force, or are there some ways that maybe we could get them to spend more time with customers? And what are we doing that's preventing them from doing that? So they, they actually brought a group of salespeople in with a group of headquarters people, and they asked the salespeople, I know it's revolutionary, to say, how are you spending your time when you're not with customers? And they found that the salespeople are spending an awful lot of their time filling out reports, doing forms, doing various kinds of research, doing all kinds of stuff, most of which is being requested from headquarters. So they did a little project. They called it Request to Field. And what they tried to figure out was, what are all these requests that are going from headquarters to the field, and could we reduce those or streamline those, and how many of them are really necessary? And of course, any of you who are in a sort of a corporate headquarters function will find that you have this emotional attachment to the information that you're requesting from your salespeople. And you can't possibly do your job without it. So you have to get that information. So it was very hard for them to let go. It took a lot of intense dialogue. And they began to you know, paper the walls with, we asked for this, and this, and this, and this, and then begin to cross it off. And do you need it that often? Do you need it? Do you really need it? What do you do with it? They traced it back. Oh, we, we give all this data. It goes back to headquarters. They analyze it. And then what happens? Do we make any decisions on the basis of it? No. So all that stuff started to get eliminated. And what they discovered is that they added back to the sales force the equivalent of a 13th month in every year. So that salespeople were able to spend the equivalent of one extra month every year directly being with customers. And the correlation of revenue started to go up very significantly. They didn't have to invest in any new systems, new products, anything. What they did was they streamlined the process by which salespeople were able to do their jobs. It's very hard. When you add this little bit of complexity, it creates frustration and reduces the ability to be able to perform effectively. Now, how, of, how often do we do that in our own organizations? We take things that should be straightforward to go from point A to point B to get something done, and we add a few twists. We say, well, why don't you add this? And let's do a little of this. And boy, it would be interesting if we knew something about that. And all of a sudden, we take this process and we make it a little more complicated. Here's an example from Conagra Foods. Conagra Foods is, is a, a premier, wonderful consumer packaged goods supplier. They provide all kinds of food brands that many of you would recognize, whether it's uh, Hunt's tomato sauce or Orville Redenbacher popcorn. And of course, one of the lifebloods of a consumer packaged foods company like that is doing advertisements on television or advertisements in print, 
to the extent that anybody looks at print anymore, or advertisements on radio or digital, et cetera. So they looked at the process of how long does it take for us to create an ad. It's an important part of the business. Seems pretty straightforward, except it was taking them anywhere from six months to a year and a half to go from a concept to an ad. And they were wondering, why does it take so long? I mean, we're, it's not taking us that long to develop new products, to go into the test kitchens and do all the research and focus groups, et cetera, but yet we can't seem to get an ad put together. So they began to map it out, and on the top of this diagram are all the steps that it currently takes, the as is. And this is a very simple technique that very easy to do. All the people need is a post-it notes and some people in a room to say, what is it we actually do? What are all the steps? What's required? And what are all the loopbacks? And in this case, there were many loopbacks where they'd get it so far, and then they'd come review it with somebody who would say, no, that's not quite what we meant. Go back and start over again. So they go back and start over again, and they get it to some point, and then somebody else looks at it and said, oh, no, I don't think that's exactly what it ought to be. And they start over again in these loops and loops and loops, and that's why it takes six months to a year and a half. And then they lay down on the bottom and say, how long should it be? Well, it should be four to eight weeks to be able to get this together. And they laid out what that would be. And all of a sudden, they began to look at this and say, who's the enemy here? Who's causing this to take so long? It's us. So the CEO, who was one of those people who kept getting into the loop late, and he would say, why did you do it like that? Or I don't like the color of the shirt that that person in the ad is wearing. Go back and do it again. The CEO began to look at this and said, well, of course, we need to all be involved in the decision making early. I see a couple of people laughing. Are you? Were you part of this process? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so once you begin to lay it out there, and people look at themselves and say, oh my god, I'm holding a mirror up, and what I'm doing is kind of silly. So if I do it differently, we can be more effective. And this began a whole process of streamlining, which, and I don't know if you've seen some of the ads that ConAgra has had, and ConAgra products have had on television, but it takes them just a matter of weeks or months to be able to put this together now. So part of this notion is that this is our responsibility as leaders and managers. So this is one of my favorite cartoons where the preacher says, you're supposed to say, I do, not I'll try. Uh, don't show this to your spouse or significant other. But one of the things that often happens in companies is that we have senior leaders who give people assignments but then don't hold them to actually carrying them out. There's no consequence. I, I was in one very prominent company not long ago where it said, you have to understand something about this company. If you do a really great job here, you will be well compensated and you'll have a great career. And if you do kind of a mediocre job here, you'll be well compensated and you'll have a great career. So it's those kind of cultural factors that have to do with leadership that create a certain amount of complexity that affects all of us. Because those of us on the receiving end, if we're given assignments without a deadline, if we're given assignments and people aren't really serious about the assignment, we sort of spin our wheels, we do other things, we end up creating all kinds of extra work that's not productive. So think about all the things that we perhaps do, and particularly those of you who, like me, are, are perhaps boomers, and we're talking about millennials who are in the workforce, and are we giving them assignments that aren't clear? Are we conducting meetings and holding meetings and asking people to come to meetings where it's not really clear why we're having this meeting? What's the agenda? What's the outcome of the meeting? Is this a decision meeting? Is this an information meeting? What are the assignments afterwards? Are there any notes? Is there any preparation before this meeting? How many of you have ever been to a meeting and you weren't sure why you were there? Anybody? It's pretty common in organizations, and we let ourselves get away with it. Now, it's easy to say, well, that's senior manager's job. You know, I mean, they're supposed to know what they're doing. But if we don't say anything, we are colluding with them. So all of us are responsibility, and that's why it's the dirty little secret of management is that complexity starts with all of us. Because it's either somebody else causing it, 
or we're allowing somebody else to cause it. All of us can do something about these kinds of habits. So I want to just end. Think about your own organizations. And th this is part of the kind of inner reflection. In your own organizations, if your product portfolio was streamlined and focused, so if, if you were more like Trader Joe's, more like Herman Miller, and you began to look at all the different products you're distributing and say, do we make money on all of those products? Do we make enough money on all of those products? Or do we have a lot of products that we just carry because we've always carried them? Or we have one customer out there somewhere in the wilds of Wisconsin that wants that product, so we're going to keep that product no matter what. Now, one of the things that we found it in the pharmaceutical company is it's very hard to get rid of products because you know, these are life-saving products, medicines, drugs. that, But there's tail-end products that they've been carrying for many years, are off patent. They're not making very much money. In fact, in most cases, they lose a lot of money because what, what it takes to carry them, et cetera. And they looked at this and said, what can we do but with and still not worry about our customers, who, who, some of whom depend on these? And they found other third parties and others who could take on some of these products and other ways of getting the products to customers without them having to do it. So one question to ask yourself of the four questions is, if your product portfolio was streamlined and focused, how much potential would there be for improvement? Second is, if the information flows in your company were more efficient and streamlined, would that make a difference? In other words, are people grinding out information? In, in one large company, that, uh, and, and I'll actually be able to say the name of this now because it's a, an old CEO and a new CEO, but you had the picture of Indra Nui up here from, uh, from PepsiCo earlier on. Her, her predecessor was Steve Reinemann. Steve Reinemann was the CEO of, of PepsiCo for many years, and he had this fantastic process of every month there was an operational review where they went through all the data in the company. And they had an army of financial analysts, literally an army, hundreds and hundreds of people around the company that would go through every product, every category, every market, every channel, and come up with all of the data. And there's a lot of products in that company. And they would create this book. And every month, Reinemann would meet with his top direct reports, and they would go through this operational book. And for many years, it was a very successful company, did very well. Indra Nui, when she became CEO, and she had been CFO, she said, I don't think we need to do this anymore. We've got all the data in the computer systems. Everybody's got their goals. We can look on an exception basis. We don't need to get together every month. We can get together every quarter. And all of a sudden, that whole process got streamlined change the information flows. The company hasn't missed a beat. They're still successful. They're still able to get everything done. What's really fascinating about that story is that during the years that Reinemann ran this process, most of his senior executives, in fact, none of them, ever raised their hand and said, Steve, I don't think this process makes a whole lot of sense. They all saluted and said, yes, sir, we're going to do it that way. So think about, in your own companies, do you have information flows that perhaps you're pushing that don't make sense, that don't add value, that don't create real information that can be usable and made for decisions, but yet either you or nobody else is pushing back on that? So that's question number two. Question number three is, if you could spend more time with customers, or if your salespeople could spend more time with customers, would it really make a difference? Could you? get rid of the non-value added or the stuff at headquarters? And could you spend more time, like the pharmaceutical company, really focused on customers? And sometimes, there was an earlier question about what about customer service? I remember somebody over there asked the question about you know, how, how do we manage customer service when we have fewer customer service people and more expectations for customer service? One of the ways to think about that is that maybe you don't have a customer service department but maybe more people or everybody is part of customer service. One of the things that Fidelity does, Fidelity Investments, is that all of the senior managers and all the people at headquarters are required to be certified in how to be on the 800 number, how to be on the phone lines. And that a certain period, I don't remember whether it's once a month or once every other month or so, 
every member of management and everyone at headquarters has to take a turn on the phones so that they are part of, they supplement the whole customer service operation. But even more than that, more important than that, it means that the senior management team and all the people at headquarters are in regular contact with customers. So they are hearing directly, what are the issues? What's going on out there? They're not hearing it secondhand and thirdhand. They have to, nobody knows, when they call the 800 number, nobody knows that it might be Ned Johnson, the, the chairman of Fidelity, that might be answering that phone. But it could be any number of senior managers that's answering the call and has to be able to be knowledgeable about what's going on and has to be able to listen to the feedback and be able to resolve issues. And then the fourth question is if you personally had more bandwidth to think about innovation and growth and what do we do differently. Think about your own time as leaders of your business, of your organization and your industry. How much of your time is spent day to day grinding out the next business, grinding out what we have to do, checking the numbers, et cetera, and how much of it is spent in conferences like this thinking about what can we do differently? How can we reinvent ourselves? How can we inter interact with our customers in different ways? How can we find the stories that our employees have? How can we do that? How do you s free up your own time to be able to do some of that? Because if you don't free up some of your time to do it, nobody's going to do it for you. That's the opportunity. There are some companies, whether it's Google or Intuit or 3M, that give their employees, everybody, a certain amount of time to think and to dream and to invent. How many of you do that in your companies? I only see one hand up. It's a very important thing to do. And even if you don't do it for your people, do it for yourself. Give yourself some time to think and to dream. Otherwise, this is a nice conference. You know, you get a couple of nice thoughts. But when you go back, you're going to be caught up in the quagmire of all the complexity and all the frustration and everything else going on. And in fact, it'll be even worse because of all the emails and texts and everything else that has piled up over the last day and a half, two days that you're here. So think about if you could answer those questions positively, how much potential would there be? And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but ask, answer your, this question yourself. If you were able to do these things, would the potential for growth and change and innovation be not much, some, or a great deal? And when I've asked this of most organizations, when they think about these questions, and if they're really serious about it, most of them said there's a pot of gold at the end of this rainbow. And it doesn't require investment in new systems. We don't have to buy new companies. If we operate in a more streamlined, efficient way, and we create the time to think differently, we can be incredibly more effective which leads to my sort of last message, the famous words of Linus, who's a great management philosopher. There is no heavier burden than great potential. And as leaders of your companies and leaders in this industry, there is incredible potential to change. And it's up to you to be able to do it. So I hope that over the next day and a half, you'll get some more insights and then be able to take this into action. Thank you.